that we can all appreciate what Buddhism does for us, that we don't take it for granted. Um, but how do you, you know, there are issues in our life when, when life gets really tough. And there are issues. And the um, life is a, is a journey. And as we go through this often difficult journey in our life, um, enlightening things happen to us. Um, so when I first started as a minister, uh, something happened when I was in San Francisco about 1978-79, and I've probably told this, but I don't think I've told it recently, about um, the man who had a mortuary in the Mission District, um, and his, uh, uh, he had a contract with the Presidio in San Francisco, and someone who was in the military passed away who was Buddhist, and he needed to have a Buddhist service. Uh, and it happened that his next door neighbor had a flower shop and was a member of our temple. So he went next door and he said, do you have, do you know of any um, English speaking Buddhist ministers? Uh, this man was also Hispanic. It was in the mission districts so and a lot of, you know, a strong Latino community there. Um, so uh, she says, yes, we have an English speaking minister at the San Francisco Buddhist Church. His name is Reverend Castro. And he started laughing, and he said, a minister, a Buddhist minister named Reverend Castro? <laughs> and so he made contact with me, and I did the service, the funeral service. And I don't remember anything about the funeral service, actually, that I did. But uh, Alex and I became good friends. The mort mortician became good friends. And even when I was transferred up an hour north of San Francisco to Inmanji, he had a crematorium up there by Sebastopol also. And so uh, he would come into town and he would call me and he'd say, I'll be in town, uh, you want to go out to lunch? And we'd go out to lunch together, you know. And so this went on for several years and then uh, one day he called me and um, he said, um, I want to talk. Uh, my 19-year-old son was killed in an automobile accident. And so, we, as we talked about it, he said, for years, I've done uh, funerals for children in the uh, Latino community. He's Mexican-American. And he said, when a child would die, they would the family, and this is when all of services were casket services. He said the family would come and they would bring his toys, all the, the stuffed animals and the toys that the child had, and they would surround, they would line the casket with all these toys. And uh, he said, when I always used to stand back and I'd look at it and I'd say, and this is literally what he said. He said, I'd stand back and I'd look at it and I'd say, why do they want to put all that junk in the casket for? It's so morbid. And then he said, when my son died, I couldn't help it. I had to do the same thing. And then he said something, and then this is the process that we're going through. He said, um, I know my son is gone, he won't come back. But having gone through this, I think has made me a better mortician because now I understand what those people are going through when they come to me. And it made me think of enlightenment in a different way. You know, we always talk about the Buddha, the enlightened one. But from a Japanese perspective, you're enlightened when you die. And as long as we're alive, we have all of the foibles and the passions and the ignorance and the uh, you know, self-delusion that go along with this life for, for most people. 
It's a very, very, very rare person who we could say maybe is enlightened in this life. But I, rather than thinking about enlightenment, I thought about enlightening things that are happening to us all the time. And as we go through life, you know, there, there's, it's kind of like you're, when you get a sense of the Dharma, it gives you a sense of spiritual gravity. And as we get knocked off balance, if we have a sense of balance, we can get back up and we can go on. Um, so, over the years, I, I've been in many uh, difficult, sad situations, and um, so often you have to respond spontaneously, right away. And I think, oh my gosh, you know, where, I could have said this, I could have said that. Monday morning minister, you know. And I feel that that's a lot of what my ministry has been. But I hope, I hope that in some way, each of us, not just the minister, but each of us can grow by those experiences as you reflect. You know, I remember once a relatively young person at early 50s dying of cancer and I went to visit them and they said perfect Buddhist perspective uh, Sensei I, I know that Buddhism teaches that attachment <coughs> leads to suffering but I can't help it I want to see my children grow up I want to see them go off to college I want to see them get married. I want to see my grandchildren. Yeah. They died two weeks later. What would you say to that person? What would you say to a person who said that to you in that situation? Yeah. So maybe these are some of the things that we'll you know, discuss. Um, what does your religion offer to you in times of crisis? times of adversity, in times of difficulty, in times of pleasure, in times where you say, life isn't suffering. What's Buddhism say life is suffering? I'm having a good time, as the young people have said. What do you say, what do you say to someone like that? So, anyway, is that my seven and a half minutes? Okay. <laughs> speaking of death a lot, but it is the hardest thing we all have to face in our suffering and the Four Noble Truths. Um, you know, and I think in Buddhism, what Buddhism does for us is, kind of like the Boy Scouts, be prepared. We prepare ourselves for crises. And so, if we are strong and stable and we listen to the Dharma, I, uh, we hope that the outcome will be when a crisis comes along, you don't get totally knocked over, you just bend a little and then you're able to come back because, uh, and for, for example, death, that it's not uh, such a surprise. You know, sometimes you'll hear someone die, oh, they died, really? And then I think, we're all gonna die. <laughs> it's not as much of a shock as we think it is. Um, but. Uh, being in the minister position, I have been for a couple of years. I don't have as much experience, but recently uh, we had a member in our sangha who was in hospice, and I visited him and his family, and he was slowly fading. He, he had a brain tumor, and so it was, it, it was, uh, he was in hospice for about three weeks. And I think when he got there, he thought he would go really fast. But he was still able to swallow and, and take soup in and it kind of, it, every day, you know, it was a very slow process. And so I was there towards the end and he was barely, he was barely you know, just whispering. It was so sad. It was, but I learned, a, I le you learn so much from being with people who are ill and dying that, uh, just as Reverend Cashel said about the mortician, you don't know unless you're in that position. And 
he, he was barely whispering and he said, it's so hard to die. And his uh, wife leaned over, oh, can I give you some water? And we were both, what can we do? And he said, looked at her. He was very witty and had a sense of humor. So take this with a sense of humor. And he said, you wait till it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what wisdom. We are all in this boat together. We can sit there and act as if he's a very rare thing to encounter, but we're all going to die. We don't know how. And I thought, what wisdom, and what an what a amazing way he had of accepting what was happening to him. He was just like, it's taking a long time. You know, so just wait till it's your turn. So, uh, you know, that, that really taught me a lot. Um, I think one thing in Buddhism that, I have, that has helped me through many, many things is, uh, you know, it's your perspective, the Buddhist perspective of no sin, no punishing God, nobody's punishing you. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I have all these notes. I don't have a great memory either. But uh, the, uh, one of the things that, that struck me was that when the tsunami hit Japan, um, they were the most prepared country in the world. They had sirens. I mean, it's like you couldn't do more to be prepared for these things. We all think if we prepare ourselves, nothing bad will happen. And yet the tsunami hit. And I came across a really disturbing article, uh, the Tokyo Governor Ishihara, and the headline read, Tokyo Governor says tsunami is divine punishment. And that is so wrong. That is, that is so wrong. Um, there's no gods to create the, the earthquake to punish us, no gods to save us. It's just subject to cause and effect. The earthquake happened under the sea, it caused the tsunami to hit land. No one, it had nothing to do with anyone's karma. It's just happened, you know, and that's, I think what we have to remember in Buddhism, one of the most important teachings for me is that we don't take it personally. It sounds kind of funny, but, um, uh, we did, we had, I was just talking with one of our Sangha members yesterday, and, we had a windstorm in Spokane, and her tree, or her neighbor's tree, fell on her brand new fence. She had just built a fence, and the tree fell on it. Well, it hit the other person's insurance company called it an act of God, and so she had to pay for it. <laughs> so an act of God is really causes and effects. I think they call it an act of God, but what they really mean is these are causes and effects that no one else could, that no one could control. And that's the way Buddhists think. We think of cause and effect. We don't think in terms of, uh, or we try not to in terms of it's someone's fault. And uh, uh, another one that really got me was that I wanted to share was um, I was watching a morning show a few couple of months ago and it was about Amy Van Dyken Rowan. I don't know if you've heard of her. She's an Olympic swimmer, and she was on an uh, SUV, ATV, sorry, <laughs> I don't know this one, in an accident last summer, and <coughs> ended up a paraplegic. And the thing that struck me was her attitude was just amazing. She lost her legs, she lost the use of her legs, and I think she could, yeah, so she could still use her arms. And she was smiling and happy, and they were, that's part of the reason she was being interviewed. They were going, how could you go through this devastating crisis from being a swimmer to being in a wheelchair the rest of your life? And I wrote this down. I had, I had recorded it, so I was able to really write it down. And she said, I never say what if, or poor me. I never say this should never have happened to me because it did. The what ifs are too late, so I'm just moving on. I love being alive, so this is just all a challenge. So she was determined to make the best of it, learn to, you know, navigate life with this new challenge. She saw it as a challenge, and I thought, wow, I don't think I am quite that far along to have that um, to call it fun. She called it fun. This has to be fun. This is my new life. So 
I think, uh, you know, the, the, I'll close with uh, the universe. We think the universe is somehow obligated to live up to our beliefs about what should be, but that's just our delusions. So I'll close with that. I go so fast. Thank you. Um, so what I would like is, we've got a nice large group here, if we can break up into groups of five to seven people. The chairs do move, so if we could turn some of the chairs around, and if I can get you to be in groups of five to seven, if you're more than five to seven, that's okay, but it gets harder to talk as a group. And I would like you to consider some of the questions that Reverend Castro and Reverend Mark have raised, and that is, what wisdom can we bring to crises um, that we can consider and prepare ourselves before we're actually in the midst of a crisis? Uh, because all these examples have been people who have already gone through the crisis or is living through the crisis, and they're trying to apply the, the wisdom. And I think what we're asking, I think what the reverends are asking is to be more mindful, not it's not exactly proactive, but to be more mindful so that we can call upon those ideas and those teachings of Buddha that will help us while we experience these crises. So what wisdom can we bring to crises that we can consider now and be mindful of before we're actually in the middle of a crisis? And you can interpret those kind of crises in many ways. It could be death. It could be a tsunami, it could be just the daily difficulties of life. So if you could do that, that to break up into small groups, that would be really helpful, and I'll come around with a pad and paper, and the reverends are going to also mill around and listen in into the conversations. Um, and if your group ends up with a question rather than a, a helpful solution, we would like to bring it back as helpful um, ideas, but if you have a question, we will also accept those and, and post them to the reverends in the last 10 minutes. Okay, thank you.
we were listening to everything, and I, I think we talked about a lot of the same things too. One of the things you said is, uh, okay, one of the questions was, how can we share your wisdom in times of need or crisis? And we uh, decided that natu to be naturally compassionate is really difficult. Um, we always think about what could we have done, what should we have said, and I think we all do that, and it's really difficult to think or to solve that question. Um, one of the things is we need to be good listeners when a person is in crisis, um, and maybe we can share our own relationship with that person and try to make it more of a positive uh, place. And when a person is in crisis or has to die, um, and that person says, oh, we, you know, my husband and I, or my wife or my partner and I have had you know, 20 years of great memories, great times, that person's in a good place, which is going to put everybody else in a good place. Um, is there anything we can say? Uh, probably not. Not enough you can say sometimes. Um, it's frustrating not to be able to help that person. Um, what's the word that you can say? What's the thought you can share? It's kind of hard. Uh, listening to some of the other groups, I know one other group said uh, their bottom line was crisis sometimes sucks. Uh, another group said uh, you can't change what happened. And I think a couple times in our in our group, I think the bottom line was. Shit happens. <laughs> <laughs> that was <it. laughs> uh, We have about one minute left, and I was wondering if Reverend Castro or Reverend R would want to say anything. 30 seconds each. Oh, I'm just going to say I've been thinking about you know some of the things that happen day to day that we're all trying to deal with. And one thing that I've kind of learned to overcome is uh, taking responsibility. If I'm in traffic, and I'm running late, and it's my fault I'm running late. Don't get mad at all the other cars, because it's only raising my own blood pressure. <laughs> it's my fault. I'll leave early next time. So that's what I can well, We've heard a lot about gratitude, and uh, I was reminded of a uh, Dharma exchange, Dharma exchange, we're talking about I'm grateful I never had to kill it. I think of that, but I know you could, you could say that. But then could you also say, I'm grateful that I can't say that. Um, what, I mean, get, gratitude gets a little tricky. And I think it, it goes back to what Reverend Jim was just saying. Ultimately, we are grateful for the dark. So that if I had to kill someone, if I were in that situation, that I have something that can sustain me, that can give me a sense of spiritual equilibrium and my spiritual balance. Well, I'm grateful that the minister doesn't go on about that. <laughs> okay, please drive me in touch. Namo Amidabas. Namo Amidabas.